MotorhomeDiaries.com. Hey everybody, we're in Mankato, Minnesota at Reconciliation Park. I happen to go to undergrad here at Mankato, and it was then that I learned that Mankato is infamously known as the site of the largest max execution in U.S. history. Uh, what we're doing here today, I just want to give you some background about what happened uh, and let you think about things for yourself and see, ask some questions about, you know, what, how, how could this have been prevented and how can we prevent this in the future? I just want to start out by saying I'm not an expert on the subject, so I encourage you to uh, go out there and research it yourself if you are interested. So in the uh, 1850s, the uh, Sioux or Dakota or Lakota Nation uh, basically stretched across the northern Great Plains and settlers started coming into uh, southwest Minnesota here and it was then that they uh, flooded heads with uh, the Native Americans. So in 1851, the Dakota tribe uh, reached an agreement with the U.S. federal government that basically said, all right, America, you can have this land as long as you give us this strip of land 20 miles by about 150 miles along the Minnesota River and give us $1.4 million over the next 50 years. So that, that was the arrangement. And they also, in addition, uh, required some food to be given from the U.S. federal government to the Native Americans living on this reservation. In 1858, Minnesota officially became a state. And at that time, uh, some representatives from the Dakota Nation went to Washington, D.C. and uh, modified their treaty. They basically said, you can have some more of our land we currently reside on uh, if, if you increase our payments. So based on the stipulations of the treaty, uh, the federal government was to give uh, payments in gold and food to these trade uh, intermediaries uh, between the government and the Indians. The traders became really corrupt. You know, they kept a lot of food for themselves, gave it to their friends, bought people off. Soon after, uh, thanks to the War of Northern Aggression, the federal government was unable to meet these payment deadlines as stipulated in the contract. So uh, the Native Americans started getting restless, uh, people were starving. So one of the traders, Andrew Myrick, stated, you know, basically said, for all I'm, I care, let them eat grass, you know, let them starve. So on August 16th of 1862, uh, there was a, uh, a group of Native Americans out hunting and they saw some eggs and one of the uh, Native Americans took uh, an egg and his friend said, uh, hey, those are white people's eggs. And he said, you know, I'm not scared of them, fuck them. And he threw it down, went inside, killed some settlers. Went back that night, uh, one of the Dakota tribes had a committee and they basically said, we've had enough. These guys have breached their contract, we're starving, we need to reclaim our land. So they went out and started attacking settlers. That day, Trader Myrick was found dead with grass stuffed in his mouth. Soon, a lot of the settlers in southwest Minnesota fled. Governor Ramsey said, the Sioux Indians of Minnesota must be exterminated or driven forever beyond the borders of the state. And the uh, governor had a general, Silby, come down, and uh, President Lincoln had another general come out to, to quell this rebellion. By mid-September, the federal government was on the offensive, and they had captured uh, over 1,200 Native Americans. Um, people in South Southwest Minnesota were out for blood. You know, a lot of them knew folks who had been killed. They had to be uprooted from their houses. So General Silby uh, initiated military commissions to, to try all these Native Americans and ruled that over three quarters of them should be put to death. A lot of people say this was just a kangaroo court. Most of these cases were, were rushed through in less than five minutes, and I think there's a lot of credibility to that. President Lincoln uh, was kept abreast of the situation, what was going on in the frontiers. When he heard that the uh, locals wanted 303 Native Americans killed, um, he was against it. But I don't think he was against it based on uh, morality reasons. He was against it because of the message that it may send the nation states in, of European countries. And he didn't want to like appear brutish and barbarian to them, thinking that they may side with the South in this war of Northern aggression. So Lincoln said, let's just execute those that were convicted of killing settlers. The number was 39. So on December 26, 1862, uh, 38 Native Americans, one of them had been granted a save execution, 38 of them were led here to downtown Mankato and they walked up this elevated uh, boardwalk essentially, uh, nooses were placed around their neck and they were hanged to the, to the cheers of thousands of spectators. The day following the hanging, General Sibley wrote to Lincoln, he said, I have the honor to inform you that 38 Indians and half-breeds ordered by you for execution were hung yesterday at Mankato at 10 a.m. Less than six months later, Congress enacted a law providing for the forcible removal from Minnesota of all Sioux. So this conflict that started in southwest Minnesota in late 1862 eventually went on for over 28 years, not ending until the bloody battle of Wounded Knee. So I think what's really at the heart of this is the property rights issue. We're not going to tackle the question today of who had first ownership of the property, but let's just say uh, from 1851 when the U.S. government formally recognized that the Native Americans, Dakota there, 
own this part of land, and they had all these other stipulations in the contract for money, for money and food. The Native Americans agreed to this contract. It was a treaty signed by both parties. But it wasn't until the United States government started to renege on its on its treaty obligations that the Native American peoples, um, you know, grew upset and grew wary of what was going on. They felt like they were neglected. Their people were starving, and they. Uh, basically needed to survive. Another important concept to think about with this uh, particular incident is mob rule, otherwise known as democracy, which somehow has a good connotation. Uh, this is essentially Group A, which has more people, the white settlers, using government, which it claims a legitimate monopoly on the use of force within a given area, to restrict those rights of Group B. So the white people are using government to, to usurp the rights of the Indians. How could this have been avoided? Uh, or, or mitigated in its in its um, impact, and uh, I think one thing is uh, lessening the, the size and power of government. One way to think about it is this: if one individual Native American came up against one individual white settler, and there was a, a property issue going on, sure there could have been a little conflict, maybe a fight, maybe some you know words people they don't relate, but because there's government which represents white settlers, this big group of thousands of people versus the, the Native American Dakotas, um, which had lesser numbers but were still organized into a, a government in a sense, and a few people on the fringes here tangle with a few people on the fringes, fringes here, it brings all these other people into the fold. So their, their uh, productivity, their time, their talents, their treasures dumped into this war effort and they just have these massive large scale conflicts where you see hundreds and thousands and, and uh, you know this century uh, tens and hundreds of millions of people die. So my question to you is how do we best prevent this? How do we mitigate these harms? I'm not saying self-government is going to be utopia. There's still going to be evil people out there, but they're not going to have this ready-made vehicle of the state with millions of people at their beck and call and this legitimate right to steal people's money called taxation to go and wage war.